All right, he's ready to go fishing. Good morning. Welcome to Generations Church. My name is Troy. So glad to have you here today. Appreciate you coming. If you're brand new, maybe you came last week and uh, you enjoyed it so much at Easter, you're like, I'll give them another try. We especially want to welcome you. Hope you'll stop by guest services and um, get a, some free swag on us. Just our way of saying thanks for, for coming today. <clears throat> now, I, I need your help with something. Now, we, we're a little, I think we're okay in this service. Last service, we were jam-packed. So one of the things we're going to be doing, uh, and I'll tell you, so, so here's the what. I'm going to ask you, uh, not right now, but like when we're crowded, to move to your right, okay? That'll be our thing. Move to your right, my left, your right, move all the way to the end of the row. Let me tell you why, because it's, uh, I think sometimes if you just tell people what and don't tell them why, they're like, I don't really want to do that. So, but if you tell people why, they get on your team, we can do it together, okay? So we're going to be in this building about eight more weeks, right? Until we temporarily evacuate the building and we're going to be online for a few weeks. And then mid-August, uh, Lord willing, we'll be at our brand new building. So, why, so about eight weeks from now, knocking the back wall out, taking these columns out. If you don't know about phase two, you can go to our website. I'll tell you all about it, Okay. So what we're trying to do is not go to three services. So we're really full at our early service. So thank you for coming to this one, by the way. Um, and, and so we're trying not to go to three because we're probably, if we didn't have a building coming, we would probably go to three services. So, um, but when you go to the right, that helps us get more folks in here. Those who are coming late, we don't have to say, excuse me, excuse me, move over. You know, you, you're, all, you're all the way there. Now you're like, well, I like to sit on the aisle. You can do that. You just have to get here early, go all the way to the right, and, and it's all yours, okay? Because we, we have about 630 chairs uh, in the building, and if we go to the right, we, we could fit everybody, but what happens is you end up you know, breaking up families and all that. You can't, get, you can't fill every chair, but we can try to fill as many as possible so we can stay with a 9 and 11 o'clock service so your pastor doesn't wear himself out with a third service. I really appreciate that, uh, but it would help us because it is. it takes a lot of effort and energy to ramp up to three because we have to get volunteers for the third service. But we know we're going to two because we're about to add 200 chairs to the building, so we're trying to do that. Thank you so much for helping us with that. You don't have to move now, but you may hear in the next few weeks, move to the right so you know what's going on. We were in uh, Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago, my, my wife and I, just went there for uh, just a weekend, relax, and see a few of the museums. We got to see the Bible Museum, which I highly recommend, great place. But one of the things we did, we just parked at the hotel and we rode Metro because I don't drive in Washington, D.C. traffic. Those people are crazy. Uh, but, but I love doing that because ride the Metro, you just kind of walk, you know, different places and, um, and I always relax and you just get to see all the crazy drivers driving around as you're walking around. So we were at this intersection. We were getting ready to cross the street, waiting for the lights to change. And um, this car's pulled up, and this one guy needed to make a U-turn. He was in the left lane. You know, I didn't know that, but he was, he was turning left, but he was hitting the U-turn, but he couldn't quite make it, right? He's right here in front of us. Couldn't quite make it. So he backed up a few feet so he could get enough room to clear the curb and then make the turn. Well, the people behind him absolutely freaked out when he put it in reverse and backed up. I mean, it took him a second to do it, but they just thought there's no way he shouldn't want to back up right here. So they free laid on their horn, you know, saying choice words. And Tab and I were just standing here, got a front row seat going, you know, like, what in the world? I mean, it's like, relax, dude. Aaron Evans, our small group director, was telling me a couple weeks ago, uh, he lives on Oak Island, lives on one of the, you know, numbered streets off of Oak Island Drive. And he said he pulled, you know, pulled onto his street. They were going to go into their house. And he had his daughter, uh, Ruby, this, you know, treehouse age daughter with him. And um, when he pulled onto his street, a car pulled out on the street with him and got right on his bumper. And he said, I was going like this, whatever, 25, 30 miles an hour, whatever the speed limit is. And this guy was just like on his bumper. Like, you know, hurry up, hurry up, you know. And, and he said he pulled into his driveway 
And the guy slowed down on his way by the house. He gave him the, you know, the double finger birdie, yelling at the window stuff at him. And, I'm, and he told me this story. I'm like, you live on Oak Island? I'm like, I thought people went there to retire and relax and you know, go to the beach. What in the world? I mean, are you in that big a hurry? It's just crazy how, how irritated people get, how their fuse is so short. Now, you know this, it's not just behind the wheel of a car. I mean, that's definitely where you see a lot of short fuses, but it's, it's everywhere. I mean, it extends to this, this um, being offended and being offensive. It extends to um, actors who slap comedians on, in award shows because they talk about their wife, right? It extends to Russian dictators who invade innocent nations for... Pff, whatever reason, right? I mean, it even goes to maybe this week, you got an email from a boss or a coworker and it was rude and it was angry. And you're like, where did this come from? And maybe it was like a group email, so it was embarrassing. Maybe, maybe this even happened to you. On the way to church today, someone was really rude in your car and you're trying not to think about it because you're in church but you're like, I can't get it off my mind because we had this argument and they said this thing and it's like, you know, this craziness, like where, do, where does it come from? My point is we live in a world where people are constantly being offended and they're being offensive. They're getting angry, they're holding grudges, they're spewing hate through social media and even in person. And, um, you know, we have a choice in this chaos. We can join the party. We can be offended. We can be offensive. Um, and, and maybe that's where you are. Like you're just at that place in your life where you're like, I'm ticked off. And if somebody says something to me about, you know, religion, politics, race, sports, my kids, my dog, I'm going off on them. I'm just ticked. Right, and there's a lot of people like that, by the way. That's why so many people are getting angry. Maybe, maybe you're like, uh, I read this quote last week from Muhammad Ali. I'm a fighter. I believe in the eye for an eye business. I'm no cheek turner. I got no respect for a man who won't hit back. You kill my dog, you better hide your cat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and maybe that's where you are. Like, you know, just like that place in life where you're just an explosion waiting to happen. Okay, I get it, I understand it. Like that's the kind of world we live in and that's a path to live. Like that's a path to travel. And a lot of people have made that choice. But, but there are consequences for that path, right? Um, constant drama, um, lawsuits eventually, maybe even getting arrested, right? There, there, there's, there's consequences if you, if you choose that. But here's what I'm thinking. Since we're here in church together, and since we're gonna open God's word, what if we took some time to see what Jesus said about being offended and about being offensive? And, and, and if, especially if you're a follower of Christ, what did Christ teach us about this area of our life on how to live when it comes to offenses? All right? Um, well, let's see what he said. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus about his savior, Jesus Christ. And he said this in Ephesians 4, 21. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, the one that got angry at the drop of a hat, the one that was easily offended. Let, let's throw that way of life off, which is corrupted by lust and deception, the, the way we used to live. Now, um, Paul's talking to a group of believers, Christ followers in the church at Ephesus. So if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ, he's talking to us. Like the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write this, not just for them, the, the Ephesians, but for you and I as well. This is the way we used to live, right? Being offended and being offensive. But now that we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, we're to live a different kind of life. Now, maybe you're not a follower of Christ. You're thinking about it. Obviously, you're in church today. Maybe somebody invited you. 
I always feel like part of my job and when I teach the Bible is I know that a, a good number of you watching online or here in person are not yet followers of Christ. And I'm so honored that you're here and you're checking it out. So I feel like part of my job is to kind of give you um, a lesson in counting the cost. If you wanna follow Jesus Christ, th this is part of the deal, okay? We're gonna give up our old way of life. And here's why. Follow Paul's thoughts here. Because we've been filled with the Spirit, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. The moment we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior is the moment that Jesus' Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, comes to dwell inside of us. And when He lives inside of us, things begin to change. Not overnight, but over time. I mean, He rearranges the furniture, attitudes change, thoughts change. The way we used to react to people who were offensive changes. It's different. Put on your new nature, he says, create to be like God, truly righteous and holy, not us making it up and trying to be good so we can get into heaven. No, no, no. The, the truly righteous, here's why it's truly righteous, because we want to, not because we have to. The Holy Spirit gives us the desire to want to live righteous and holy. Matter of fact, I would just say this. Some of you are not even gonna believe me. If you're not a Christian, you won't believe me. If somebody said to me, Troy, you can get away with sinning for the next year, sin as much as you want, or you could live truly righteous and holy, filled with the Holy Spirit. I promise you, I would choose to live righteous and holy. There's something about the presence of God. I can't wait for heaven. Don't kill me today, but I can't wait for heaven. To be in God's presence and be holy is way more fun than sin. I'm telling you, it's amazing how God will change your heart. So, um, so here's what he said. So now we're filled with the Spirit. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth for we're all parts of the same body. I mean, why would you lie to yourself? Why would you lie to the body of Christ? We're all part of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. It's not a sin to be angry. There's righteous anger, but there, most of the time when we get angry, it is sinful because it's part of our flesh. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. That means, you know, don't go to sleep. If you're having a fight with your spouse, stay up, work it out, whatever. And here it is, watch this. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. I wanna talk about that little phrase a second because I think it's so, so important. Um, the, the word foothold in the Greek literally means a place or occupying a space. So I have um, this you know, software I use, I click on a, a word, uh, like a word like foothold, and it'll give me the definition in Greek, but it'll also give me uses of it in, in other non-biblical reference in ancient Greek. So you can look at other times it's used in ancient Greek, and it helps you understand its use better in the Bible. Well, a couple of different ways that um, this word foothold was used in ancient Greek was to refer to a bookmark that was placed in a book. So you want to place your, you want to hold your place in that book, you put your bookmark there. And another way it was used was in reference to an occupying army invading enemy territory. So think of it this way, World War II, right? Uh, D-Day, we invaded, um, France, basically the beaches of Normandy uh, in you know, June 1944. We're like, okay, we're going in because we've been kicked out of Europe. The allies have been kicked out, but we're like, to defeat Hitler, we gotta have boots on the ground. We gotta invade uh, Europe. So there was a day when we rushed in, you know, thousands of people and we gained a foothold on the beaches of Normandy. Why, so we could just lay on the beach and have a suntan? No so that we could go deeper into France and gain a stronghold in Europe and eventually take over Europe. Now watch this. This is exactly what Satan wants to do in my life and in your life. He wants to get a foothold in your thoughts, in your attitudes, in your actions, so that he can gain a stronghold so that he can destroy your life. That's what he's doing. How does he get a foothold? Anger when you're easily offended, when there's a chip on your shoulder and it, and it gets knocked off and you're angry and you don't forgive 
that anger, you, you keep it with you and you're ticked off all the time, Satan just gained a foothold in your life. Now, hopefully the title of this series makes more sense to you. Don't take the bait. Today and over the next few weeks, we're gonna be talking about the bait of Satan and how he tries to bait us and gain control of our lives by, by causing us to be bitter, to, to have revenge. Today, we're gonna to talk about being easily offended. All these behaviors that undermine our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. And I want you to notice something about the way Satan works. I mean, he is so sly about it. You got all these baits up here, right? We got shrimp pots and crab pots and nets and minnow buckets, and we got hooks and worms and all this stuff. You know, and, and, and this is kind of the way I want you to think about Satan and what he's trying to do when it comes to this area of anger and being easily offended. Now, I don't want to glorify Satan. He's a defeated foe. Like Jesus Christ defeated him when he died on the cross and when he rose from the dead. We celebrated that last week, right? That we've overcome death, hell, and the grave and even sin itself by the power of Jesus. Um, and, and so one day Satan's gonna be judged for, for his sin. He's gonna be cast in the lake of fire and he's gonna burn forever. So what his strategy now is, he knows he's a, a defeated foe because God always, always keeps his word. So he's trying to take as many of, many of us with him as possible. And so, um, but, so here's the deal. Even though he's a defeated foe, uh, he's a strong foe. And here's what he is. He's a patient fisherman. Like he's just, he's good at what he does in tempting us. And so if you don't take the bait the first time, he'll bring along a little worm, you know? He's, he's creative in the way he tempts us. So if you're, you've got a hot temper, you know, man, he'll, he'll set that treble hook in you and he'll hook you and he'll get you mad. But, but, you know, if you're not someone who's easily angered, well, he'll just be what, like this little worm coming along and go, can you believe what they said about you? And, and those thoughts will just go in our mind. That's what he does. That's the way he works. He's sneaky like that. He is, um, he, and he tries to get us hooked. Because if we can get that foothold in our lives, he's, at, he's got us. He's got that hook in our mouth and, he, and he's gonna get that stronghold in our lives. So since we have an enemy that's trying to bait us, and since we live in a world so easily offended where people are getting ticked off all the time, I wanna be real practical today for you. I wanna give you some some counsel from God's word that's been so helpful to me through the years. And, 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 I, and it's really, here's what it is. It's some tools for your toolbox, okay? Think of it this way. These are tools that will keep us from getting a, a hook in our mouth and getting baited by Satan. Really kind of life skills that, that I've learned along the way, many of you have learned. And, and, but I will say this to you. This is why I want you to trust Jesus as your savior. When we have the Holy Spirit, these things I'm about to give you become a whole lot easier, okay? These are escaping the bait of being offended. You write these down if you have something to write them down with. Number one, we have to learn to confront sin. We have to learn to confront sin. A lot of us don't wanna do this, it's hard for a lot of us, but this is something that Jesus taught us. This is fundamental to resolving conflict and to getting over offenses. Matthew 18, Jesus gives us a simple and incredibly effective plan for resolving conflict. Matthew 18, he says, if another believer sins against you, go privately, that's important, and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. By the way, this works for believers and unbelievers. It works for sins, big sins, little sins, big offenses, little offenses. It works for family, friends, coworkers. This is amazing advice. It's rarely followed, but it's so good. And, and actually, we won't take time to read all of Matthew 18. It's a great chapter. Jesus gives us a plan that, okay, if they don't listen to you, uh, hopefully they'll listen to you, but they don't, you go with, with another person. You elevate it. They don't listen to you, know, you and another person, bring it to the church leaders. You elevate it further. It's just a great plan. 
And, and, I've, and I've had this done to me before several times. And I've confronted other people in this spirit many times in my life as a leader, but also as just a, you know, a fellow believer in relationship with other people. And I can tell you this, it absolutely, positively works. And here's why I think it works so powerfully so often. Because it's so rare. <laughs> because most people don't talk to each other. You know what they do? They talk about each other, right? They don't go and confront that thing because it's hard to have those conversations. So instead, they just talk about everybody at the office. They tell everybody at the office except the one person they need to talk to. They gossip about them. Or they tell, you know, everybody in the family except the one person, you know, the elephant in the room, they just avoid it. And it's the worst thing we can do. It just elevates it instead of putting it out by talking to that person directly, going to them. Disagreements happen. Offenses happen. Intentionally, unintentionally, because that's what I found most of the time when you go to somebody, they're like, oh, I don't even know I said that or did that that was offensive. It happens unintentionally a good bit of the time. But here's what healthy families do. You, you listening? Healthy families talk to each other, not about each other. Healthy businesses where you work, they talk to, <coughs> excuse me, I'm speechless. I'm so overwhelmed. With it. They talk to each other, not about each other. Healthy churches, say it with me, talk to each other, not about each other. That is so, so important. So if you come to me and you have a complaint against a staff member or your small group leader or somebody at Generations Church, do you know what the first question I'm gonna ask you is gonna be? Have you talked to that person? <laughs> and if you haven't, then what you're about to tell me is gossip and slander because God wants you to talk to that person, not about them, all right? That's the first thing. Number two, we have to, this is a hard one, we have to learn to be rebuked. So sometimes we go to people with an offense. Sometimes people are gonna to come to us with an offense. And part of maturing as a Christian, part of growing as just a human being is we have to learn to receive it. Proverbs is so good. There's some great Proverbs on this. Proverbs chapter 12, verse one. To learn, you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. So this is probably the closest I know that the Bible comes to calling it stupid, stupid. But you know what? If you're refusing to receive correction and discipline in that moment, you're stupid, okay? I'm just gonna tell you, that's, that the Bible says it. All right, let's, let's go down a little further in Proverbs 12. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Now, I want you to stare at this verse a second, okay? Which one are you? Are you wise? Are you a fool? Now think back to the last time somebody confronted you about something. <laughs> okay, now answer it. Are you wise or are you a fool? I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I was a young pastor, I was a complete fool. Uh, hopefully I'm a little wiser now, but when I first started ministry and people would come to me with, complaints or, you know, something that I said that was offensive or, and I did that a lot or, or, you know, did things wrong. And sometimes they did it the right way. They pulled me aside. Sometimes they did it in anger. It was the wrong way, whatever. But my reaction was almost always the same. It was foolish. In other words, when they were talking, this is what I was doing. I was thinking about what I was going to say to them in reply. I was like, I can't wait till they shut up because I'm going to let them have it. And I was, sometimes I didn't even wait for him to stop. I would interrupt him and I would argue and I wouldn't listen to the rebuke that they had for me. And, uh, you know, and here's what happened. Um, some of the time people left the church because of it. But all the time I lost my influence in that person's life because I wasn't willing to listen to what they had to say. Here, here's how you know, this is for all you young leaders. Here's how you know when you're not leading you look around and nobody's following, right? I've been there before, okay? And that's what happens when you don't listen when people wanna give you a correction. So now when somebody corrects me, by God's grace, by his spirit, here's what I do. And I tell myself this, shut up, Troy. 
because I don't want to listen to it. I mean, nobody likes to get corrected, right? I know you don't, I don't either. But I tell myself, be quiet, do not interrupt. Listen to what they're saying to you. And I try to calm myself down. And I try to listen to what they're saying. And watch this, here's what I found, so important. So much of the time, when they're speaking, they are speaking to me the very words of God. I'm telling you, because here's what happens. We won't listen to the Lord. We're ignoring his word or we're getting busy in life or we're doing. So God has to send somebody else who speaks out loud to us because we're not listening in prayer. God will speak to us and he will tell us things that we cannot see because we don't know what we don't know, right? There's things in our leadership we don't know. So God sent in his grace and his love, sent someone into our lives to give us a word of rebuke. I hope you'll listen to it. And God will speak to you through that. Um, and I, and I, again, I, I'm so glad um, that you're a part of Generations Church. So don't hear this the wrong way. But it may be that you came to our church because of conflict at another church. It may be that you came to the marriage you're in because of you know, conflict in another marriage that you were unable to work out because you were unable to listen. Doesn't apply to everybody here, but if you left mad because of something else, because you didn't listen to the rebuke, it may be that God's calling you to go back and make it right. I'm not saying you gotta get remarried to that person or go back to that church. Maybe that ship has sailed, but maybe God's calling you to make it right. Because here's what I found. So many people who go from job to job, to church to church, to marriage to marriage, never take time to go, maybe the problem is not them. Maybe the problem is me. And if I can stop and own it, this will be the last marriage I'm in. This will be the last church I'm in. This will be the last, I can retire at this company because I'll quit ignoring people and I'll listen to the rebuke that God has for me. Just, you know, take that for what you will. Number three, we have to learn to overlook an offense. We have to learn to overlook an offense. We're just not gonna agree on everything, right? Sometimes it has nothing to do with sin. Sometimes it just has to do with personal preference, different, the way God made us differently, you know, as a husband and a wife, uh, as friends, it's just, that's the way it is. We have to learn how to forgive and compromise and we have to learn what our coach tried to teach us when we played sports in high school. We have to learn how to play on a team, right? It's so important. I remember when I was a little kid, I was learning this lesson. I was at some friend's house and my buddy, he had a big side yard, it was like a football field. And we used to go there to play football all the time. And I, I had the football, right? I got this Nerf ball that you could throw for a mile. And I, and I had the ball and we were playing and we got in some disagreement over the rules or something. I don't even remember what it was. And I got mad, I'm like, I, you've heard it before, you take your ball and go home. I'm like, I'm gonna take my ball and go home. And I took my ball and I, go, and I went home, rode my bike home. I was like, I showed them, you know, they, don't gotta, they got a sorry ball to play with now. And, but I got home, you know what I felt like? Man, I wanna go back and play with them. Now I'm bored to death. I wanna take my ball and go back and play with my friends. We find out that flying solo is not so great after all. Um, we're just not gonna agree on everything. So how many of you know someone, don't answer this out loud, don't raise your hand. How many of you know someone who is bitter? Like they're just offended, chips on their shoulder, they're bitter all the time. If you could dig into their past, you will find some offense in their past that they haven't let go of yet. And there is no win in being bitter. I mean, nobody wins in this. You'll never meet someone who said, those years I was bitter toward my ex-husband, best years of my life, right? You never hear anybody say that. Those years that I hated my mom and dad, man, I was such a great human being those years. No one ever says that. Bitterness destroys us. I mean, you've heard the saying before, bitterness is poison we drink and expect someone else to die. That's how dumb it is. It just doesn't work. So, so watch this, last proverb I wanna show you, Proverbs 19, verse 11. Here's what we do with wrongs. So sometimes we confront, other times we do this. Sensible people control their temple, temper. They earn respect by overlooking wrongs. This is so true. 
Like the people we respect the most are not the people who have, you know, this temper that they lose at the drop of a hat. They're not the people who scream at their kid on the bread aisle in, in food line, right? Those are not, the people we respect are the ones who keep their cool. The ones who have learned to be a grown up and overlook the wrongs. Well, now here, here it is in uh, NIV, I love the way it reads here. Same verse, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. I love that phrase. There's someone offended me. I'm going to overlook it. I'm going to overlook the offense. And here's what it is. It, it glorifies God and it brings glory to you as well. It's, it's, it brings respect to you, glory to your situation. And I'm telling you, I could give you thousands of examples of this in history. Um, I mean, I just see it so much in the Bible and in and, and history. So many examples of people when they overlook an offense, it brings glory to them, glory to their cause. I'll give you an example. We celebrated uh, Martin Luther King Day just a few months ago. But Martin Luther King Jr., a lot of people who celebrate King's achievements have no idea how he achieved so much in his life. Like what was, what was his course of action to do it? Here's how he did it. He overlooked offenses. It's exactly how he did it. You know, um, who King was named after? Um, Martin Luther, right? Martin Luther King's dad named him after the great Protestant reformer, Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a guy who overlooked offenses. He, 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 he knelt uh, up on the, the church, the, the door of the church at Wittenberg, the 95 Theses. He says, these are things that the Roman Catholic Church, the indulgences, things they're doing wrong. He didn't start a war. He didn't, it was a nonviolent protests of here's what they're doing wrong. And of course, they wanted to kill him most of his life. And he never fought back. He just wrote and he, and he led the Protestant Reformation in a lot of ways. Same with King, right? It was nonviolent protest. Who do they learn this from? Both of them learned it from their Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus modeled for us. He died on the cross for our sins. He protested sin by dying for it. He was nonviolent in what he did. Now, when he comes back, that's gonna be a different story. But he modeled for us the way we're to live our lives. Well, Philip Yancey, one of my favorite authors, he grew up a racist, he wrote a whole book about his past, but Dr. King, well, Jesus Christ and Dr. King were really pivotal in Yancey overcoming his racism and, and God you know, really changed his mind. And he wrote this about King, and it was such a great insight um, for me. He said this about Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, he would, King would seek out the meanest sheriffs in Alabama and Mississippi and plant his unarmed body directly in the path of their dogs and fire hoses. His goal, King used to say, was not to defeat the white man, but to awaken a sense of shame within the oppressor. And the best way to shame a nation was to fight violence with aggressive non-violence. Do you know how uh, King, <coughs> excuse me, do you know how King changed America? How we, you know, the legislation that changed the Jim Crow laws and all that? It was through this, through nonviolence uh, protest. Because what happened was these people, these racists would spray King with fire hoses and, and you would see it in Selma and, and other places and people would watch that on TV and they'd go, I don't want to be a racist. I'm not going to associate myself with them. I'm going to associate myself with King and the people like him. And, and the hearts of America begin to change. That's how, that's how people are changed. I mean, the people who, who rioted after the George Floyd protest and, and, and uh, broke into businesses, looted businesses and harmed people, they, they did more harm than good. They divided our nation even more. The grown up in the room is Martin Luther King and people like him who understands how people's hearts are changed. They're changed when we overlook an offense. It brings glory to God and, and brings glory to our cause. Now I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, Troy, you want me to overlook an offense? That is so weak. I'm not gonna overlook an offense. I'm gonna fight against it. Let me ask you this. Who's the weak one? 
Is it the fish who bites into the treble hook, gets a hook in his lip, gets caught, and gets eaten for dinner? Or is it the fish who escapes the trap and gets to swim in the deep ocean blue? I would argue it's the latter. See, I grew up um, next to Sam Rayburn Lake. My dad used to say 12 minutes from the boat ramp. And uh, it's a big freshwater lake in Texas. And so um, one of the things that, so my dad, he, he loved fishing. He took me fishing a lot as a kid. And one of the things that my dad taught me pretty early on, and he had to keep teaching me because I, I for, kept, kept forgetting, was how to set the hook on a fish. So freshwater, you know, lake, we're fishing for bass, crappie. Y'all call them crappie around here. That didn't even sound appetizing. Uh, <laughs> crappie and uh, stropper, you know, things like that. And so you know that when that fish is nibbling on it, you set the hook. Not, not too hard. You don't want to jerk it out of their mouth, but you don't just start reeling in. You set that hook. And when you set the hook, what happens is that hook gets in that lip, and he's going to have a hard time spitting it out. You've got a lot better chance of getting him in the boat. Now, now watch this. Here, here's where some of you are. Satan has put that bait out there, and it's so attractive, and you're nibbling on it. Like it's, it's, it's what I said before. It's that I cannot believe what he said to you. You gonna take that? And those thought, and, you're, and, the, and that baits in your mouth. That anger is festering. And you're so close to doing something really stupid. Because here's what happens. Satan's gonna set that hook. When that hook gets in your mouth, all of a sudden you follow a course of action that you can't change. You're gonna say something, you're gonna do something, you're gonna create a conflict that's gonna have years of repercussions where there's unforgiveness on both ends and there's danger on both ends. And I'm telling you, don't take the bait. Don't follow that course of action. Do what God's word tells us, overlook the offense. I'm gonna give you a final challenge. I'm running out of time here, here we go. Overlooking the offense. Final thing I wanna give you, three things. Number one, name something you're offended by right now, not out loud. Name something you're offended by right now, right now. Name the event, name the person, name it. Like, and say it to the Lord. Say it out loud at some point today. Uh, just so, because you know what it is, but sometimes like it's just in there and until we say it and name it, we have a hard time overcoming it. That's the easy part. You know it's gonna get harder. Number two, Make a decision to overlook the offense. Make a decision. Once you've named it, you know what it is. Forgive that person in your heart. Here's one. Pray for that person. You know that you cannot, be pr you cannot pray for someone's success and be angry at them at the same time. You should try it. Pray for that person who's offended you. And then maybe make a phone call. Schedule a visit to sit down with them and to work it out. Remember what I said, sometimes we confront sin, sometimes we overlook it, okay? God will give us the wisdom to know the difference. Because sometimes when you confront it, it just escalates it. You just need to overlook it. You just need to forgive it, walk away from it, and go, okay, I'm good, right? So we gotta know the difference between those two. The final thing I tell you is join a school of fish. Find some people swimming free in the big ocean blue, and they're all over Generations Church, and join a school of fish. See, our tendency when we're offended is to isolate. Our tendency when we're offended is to withdraw from people, is to let that sin, that offense, fester in our heart. Go in, in that, but that's how we take the bait. Don't take your ball and go home. Sit down, get, it, get back in the game. Confront the offense, overlook the offense. And this is a great week to join the school of fish to join a bunch of people at Generations Church who are trying to walk with Jesus Christ, being led by the Holy Spirit, and at times overlooking offenses. A bunch of people who are learning how to do life together. This is the week that we kick off our sermon-based small groups. So we have semesters here at Generations Church, three or four a year, where we start out, and they last about nine weeks, where we take, we have small groups, a bunch of them, about 50 small groups here, that will take the sermon from Sunday and we'll discuss it. So you don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to know a lot. You may not even be a Christian, but you're like, I wanna talk about the sermon with a group of people who are trying to put it into practice. You can do that. 
And the reason we have semesters, we have easy on-ramps and off-ramps. So let's say you get an on-ramp, you join a small group this semester, but these fish stink. And sometimes, you know, you get in the wrong small group, that's okay. You can get, a, you can get off at the end of the semester or the middle of the semester or whatever and, and try another one again. So we want you to, to join a small group. The way you do that is you'll see on the screens, 94,000 GC Connect. You can do as Melanie said, sign up for our Next Steps class. We've got some room for next week, our Next Steps class, learn more about the church, and you can sign up for a sermon-based small group. We would love for you to plug in and join us and be a part of Generations Church, not just coming on Sunday morning, but, but getting involved and being a volunteer and, and being a part of a small group and really growing in your walk with the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? I want us to close in prayer. And I, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to obey the Holy Spirit right now. You know if God's put that person, that event on your heart, if there's something between you and somebody else, and it may require a conversation or it may just require you right now in this moment going, I forgive. I release it. I'm not going to be a bitter person. I'm not going to take the bait of Satan. I'm not going to be easily offended with a chip on my shoulder. Instead, I'm going to do, Lord, exactly what you've told me. And as we're praying together, just release that to him in this moment. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you give us the power to overcome the bait of Satan. You give us the skills and the truth and the tools in our toolbox to be able to see it for what it is, a, a, a foothold that can destroy our lives. And so, Lord, I pray for your grace. I pray for the courage. I pray for the strength to let go of that offense for every person here. Lord, give us the power to do that. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, that you forgive us of so many things every day, <laughs> so many sins that we have uh, sinned against you. And when we walk in that grace and we, we realize how good you've been to us, it makes it so much easier to let go of other offenses. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.